simply most well-known hymn of all the Christian hymns. I never get tired of doing it because of what that hymn really brings back to me. It's not just grace, it's the grace of our God and it's amazing grace. And when I think of God's grace as it just permeates scripture, we know that we are saved by his grace. We know that we are kept saved in his forever family by his grace. We know that we're instructed by his grace. We know that we're disciplined by his grace. We know we're reminded to look for his soon coming by his grace. Everything is about the matchless, amazing grace of the Lord. And so while we park on that, that helps us as we begin to get into Scripture and we learn certain truths, we start then realizing that we haven't always either known those truths because of not taking the time to study them, or not living those truths, even though we've known those truths, and we can get pretty beat down, and Satan sometimes wants us to be so filled with guilt and failure that we just basically give up and just kind of go along, but never really grow up in Christ. And it's through his amazing grace that the Lord every day, moment by moment, he gives us a do-over when we realize that we haven't been where we should be, and yet knowing that God now will help us to get where we ought to be, and all for his own glory, so it's amazing grace. And so as I begin this series that we started last week and continue it for the next few weeks on the, what a wise father will teach his son, some of us are going to say, oh, I missed that, oh, I should have done that, oh, I didn't do that, I didn't know that. I don't want you to leave here with a, a tremendous weight of guilt. I would like us to uh, take that guilt and use it as perhaps a little bit of pain when we feel it and then correct it and get to be where we ought to be so we can move forward. And we can do that by his amazing grace. The series is called What Wise Fathers Teach Their Sons. And for many of you that are not uh, men and those of you who are not fathers, you might think, well, I really don't need to know this. Let me tell you that this truth is so important, these truths are so important that even what you haven't received from your father or from a godly mother, that these truths are still found in scripture and these 10 lessons that we're going to learn are lessons that we could learn whomever might teach us. But I'm building the biblical case that it really should come down from the Father. So those of you who are single ladies, I pray that you'll be desiring to have a, not a Christian to marry, but a dedicated Christian man. Let me make that very clear. Not just a dedicated Christian, but a dedicated Christian man, if you're a lady. And that that man is hungering and thirsting after following God's teaching. And should you be blessed with children, he would then already have these values embedded within him about these lessons. And so we're going to talk about that in just a little bit. So I guess I asked the dads here, what are you teaching your sons and perhaps daughters and in context the sons here? What are you teaching them? Do you know what to teach them? I know my dad taught me how to throw a baseball. My dad taught me how to tie my shoes. And I'm very grateful my dad taught me how to drive a car. Uh, my wife would think he wasn't a very good teacher, but for the most part, I think he taught me well how to drive a car. Now, the thing that we learn from our dad should be that which God would want us to learn. And there's a mandate from the Lord. The mandate is what we're to teach them as well as that we are to teach them. So guys, if I could put my arm around you and you put your arm around me, we need to man up. We need to dad up on all of this and really own that mandate from the Lord, which would be to prepare the next generation to know God. And we're going to talk specifically what those lessons are in the weeks to come. We might have some time today, we may not. But today I want you to pick up on the mandate. Now when I think about that, where, when did the mandate really begin? It actually began way back when the children of Israel were still wandering in the wilderness. The nation was now being built up and a command was given to them to hold that nation together and that they should all worship the Lord as one God. And to do that, the teachers, the dads specifically, were to own that truth in their heart and to love the Lord with all of their heart, soul, and mind then that was supposed to be taught to the sons in context and the grandsons in context, and it's mentioned more than once. Perhaps because the masculine influence was so strong in the Jewish culture, in the beginning budding Jewish culture, that it would then spill over into the relationship with the wives and the sisters and the daughters, etc. So it really fell upon the men. Well, we know that uh, there are many households that don't have the masculine head of a godly father or any father at all for that matter, and the Lord does show that Kids can still survive and thrive if that's not the case, if there's certain givens. So the mandate came upon the men. It started back then, and it was supposed to be then propagated down the line. We next see it in the life of King David. Arguably, Israel's greatest king was David. And on his deathbed, his deathbed declaration 
was a very important one because he was speaking it to the son that would be the wisest man that ever lived. So you had the greatest king speaking to the wisest man a great truth, which was to love the Lord and live that love out in obedience to the Lord in everything that he did. So he followed that mandate of teaching his son Solomon. Well, then Solomon... He had a model. He had a model in his dad. So this model was his own father to do this. And what a great model that he had in many ways. Of course, all dads have pukas in their life, little holes in their life. They have things that are not right. And, of course, David had a problem with women, as we well know, especially one, as you well know, and what that brought about and all the conflict that he had in his life. Later on, you'll find that Solomon basically had the same. His was so bad, though, it turned his heart away from the Lord nearing the end of his life. But back to that, Solomon still picked up that mandate. So then from him then became a message. And you'll find probably the greatest truths to be able to teach your sons in a more pragmatic way from the book of Proverbs, which is often referred to as the book of wisdom or wisdom Proverbs coming from Solomon. Now, we know that those principles that he received came from the Lord. I believe most came from the Lord, if not all of them, when he was given wisdom from the Lord when he wasn't asking for riches and just said, Lord, I just want to be a knowledgeable king that knows what I should do. And God gave him that. And I think then he was flooded with so much truth, so much understanding, so much wisdom that came from the Lord. But he didn't keep it to himself. That's important. He decided then to write it to his son and sons. And that's what we're going to begin picking up today is what, what do we teach to our sons and why is that very important and what could be some of the things that we could teach. So over the last six or seven months, I've been really spending a lot of time in Proverbs chapter 1 through 10. I know there are 31 chapters in the book, but I spent more of my time in the first 10 chapters. And I wanted to glean from those 10 chapters some lessons. So instead of making lessons come out of this, I kept reading it over and over again in commentaries and listening to other preachers and everything that I could on it to see if what would kind of percolate to the top would be some lessons. And there are 10. I could perhaps be most authentic with you by saying I could have come up with 100 lessons. But these are the 10 that seem to resonate most with me that I believe that dads should teach their sons. But if there was one umbrella that would cover all the 10 lessons, the first one would be on wisdom and how important having wisdom would be. And we see that in Scripture. So if you have your Bibles, I'd like you to open it up now to Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1. If you don't have a Bible, maybe pick out maybe one of your um, uh, tablets that have a Bible uh, software program in there or whatever. That would be great. Maybe you have an app for a Bible. I will be using the New American, and that way it's a little bit more of a literal translation, and it works better for um, uh, interpretation purposes. Look, if you will, at Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, and it begins by saying, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, and fools despise wisdom and instruction. So it talks about getting knowledge, and it talks about the danger of not getting wisdom and how important for us to have that wisdom in our life. So I thought it would be good for us to understand a little bit about wisdom. If you go through the book of Proverbs, there are probably two or three words that, are, that could be interchanged for the word wisdom. Well, one of those words would be the word instruction. So when you read the word instruction, that would be a very similar word to the word wisdom. Another one would be the word understanding. So when you read the word get understanding, it would be like saying get wisdom. Another one would be the word discretion, the ability to know right from wrong or good, better, and best, to have discretion. So it would be understanding, instruction, and discretion would be all part of the word wisdom. But if I took it back to the original language and I took us into the New Testament and we looked up the word wisdom, to keep it as simple as possible, it would come from a Greek word which is the word Sophia. Some of you might have even named your daughter Sophia because you knew that that word meant wise or wisdom and that's what it means. Now when you study Greek, you're going to find that Greek is a great um, language because it's like a rose that's a bud and in Greek it opens it up and it just it's still a rose but it's so colorful and it's so full and so rich. So I like to use a general term of it's conceptual. So when it talks about being wise, it's like having concepts of all this understanding and, 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 and a belief system of truth. When you get into the Hebrew, the Hebrews really, they spoke in not such general terminology. Their words happen to be more literal. I mean, it's really kind of like black and white in your face. So when they would define the word wisdom, that word wisdom for them would be simple. It would mean living right or wisdom or truth in right living. 
I call it knowledge applied. So when they said, if you're wise, that means you've got knowledge and you're living it already. You're applying it. You're not spending all day trying to parse it all and try to figure it all out. You're just doing what God says and bing, you do it. You know, if you talk to some Jewish people that are really immersed in their culture, you know everything is pretty much black and white. Get right. Get with the program. Yeah, well, that's what it is. Wisdom is, hey, live right. Got it? Get it? Good. All right. That's how they are. So when you read that and you hear wisdom, don't go way off on that. It's just living righteously according to God's truth and ultimately for his glory as you begin to learn that. And that's pretty important. So when I did a little bit further, because if dads are supposed to be wise and in their wisdom, they're to teach their kids and their sons particularly, and their sons are to be wise, how important is wisdom? Well, predominantly that word wise or wisdom is found many times in the book of Proverbs. The phrase wise-hearted is found once. Wiser is found twice. Wisely is find, found three times. Just the word wise alone is found 63 times. The word wisdom that we're talking about this morning is found 48 times. And out of those 48 times it's found in Proverbs, it's found 26 times just in the first 10 chapters. That's why, again, if there's such an overdose of wisdom in the first 10 chapters, and I'm teaching on this, I wanted you to know that you dads would wise up and be the dad who would pursue wisdom and want your kids to know wisdom as well. So as I went a little bit further in that, I noticed that it talked about how important it is, how not only prominent is the word, but also how that we need to hunger and thirst after wisdom. It's something that's a lifelong pursuit in our life for wisdom. So if you will look at Proverbs chapter 2 for a moment, and while all, all of us want us to kind of peek in the window, dads, I want this to be really in your heart now. Look what it says in verse 1 through verse 5 to begin with on the importance of wisdom. Again, the father speaking to his son, writing it in such a manner underneath the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So this is God speaking to us through the writings of Solomon. He says, my son, if you will receive my words and treasure my commandments within you. That means you're receiving them into your mind. You're now treasuring them within you. You're engaged. You own these. You're embracing these. If you do that, then here's what you need to do. Number two. Make your ear attentive to wisdom. In other words, choose to put yourself under the sound of biblical wisdom. You want to know wisdom. That is your highest calling, is to hear it. Then it says, incline your heart to understanding. Now let's pause for a moment because you see the word heart there. In our language, when we hear the word heart, we say, oh, I love you, Kara, with all of my heart. You know, and I do. I love my wife with all of my heart. That's our emotion. That's our feeling. But in the biblical languages, it's far beyond the word emotion. It's really the word, I'm loving you with my intellect. I understand what I'm doing, why I'm doing it, how I should do this. So, Carol, I don't love you with my pumping organ. <laughs> I love you with my mind. I know who you are. I know what your needs are. I know that I need to know what those needs are. I need to know how to connect into you. I want to serve you. I want to make sure your life is as easy as possible. I just care for you. That's coming from my mind. Now, other times in Scripture, it will refer to somewhat of the heart, but a little lower. This gets gross. It's called bowels. Now, don't go too gross on this. It's not just the lower bowels, but it's that gut. And so why would it say in one place mind and the other place gut? Because some of us know that when you're going through times in your life, you know that you kind of feel it here. We would call it, I got a knot in my stomach. I feel uncomfortable. Have you ever used that phrase? I feel nauseous when I heard that. Have you had that feeling today yet? I'll leave that alone, all right? And so what has happened is it went to your mind, and then it went into your gut, into your bowels here. So it is true, it might come in through your mind, but it'll also affect inside you. So when we say the word heart here, I want you to know that it is a true understanding of wisdom is not totally void of emotion, but not only driven by emotion as well. It goes into our thoughts. So let's go back to the passage. You'll hear me say a lot about heart, just remember that. So it says, make your ear attentive to wisdom, incline your heart to understanding. In other words, not only cock your ear to wisdom, but he says, lean into understanding. In other words, whenever you have the opportunity to learn more about God and his word and how we're to live that, that's what we should be inclined to do. Verse 3, it says, for if you cry for discernment, lift your voice for understanding. If you do these things, if you seek her, that would refer back to wisdom, as silver, and search for her as for hidden treasures. And think about that for a moment. Wisdom, you seek for that like it's silver. 
Have any of you ladies ever lost a piece of jewelry someplace and you had to dig around in your drawer to find it and you looked in your jewelry box to find it? That's a little bit like that. You're, you you want to get that treasure and find out where it might be and you'll pay whatever cost that it will be. And so he says that's what we should do towards wisdom. We should want it so badly that we're going to search it out for that hidden treasure. It also says what the benefit will be, verse 5. Then you will discern the fear of the Lord and discover the knowledge of God. So some of you that are saying, I wish I knew God better. Well, in order to really know God, instead of just knowing him intellectually like some kind of dead orthodoxy, you want to know God, it's got to come from someone that really fears the Lord. In other words, you have to understand why you need to know this, what this truth is really all about, what's the purpose of this truth, this knowledge of God and how it affects you, and why it's important for us to continue drilling into those truths about the knowledge of God. Because it's at that stage now that you begin to get wisdom. So it kind of works together. It's kind of like one of those antitheses. All right, I want wisdom, and if I have wisdom, I'll get to know God. But I can't really know God unless I get wisdom, and if I get knowledge of God, then I'm going to know wisdom. So they both kind of work together. I like to use it. One hand washes the other. When I really want wisdom, then I'm going to know God. If I really know God, I'm going to get more wisdom. They both work together. Many years ago, I had a tumor in my left hand. It was a big tumor in there, and eventually it had to be um, taken out, surgically removed. And so when they did that, they made a little Z mark here, like Zorro on here, and they peeled it back. They kind of cut it all out. They wrapped it all up. They wrapped it, wrapped it, wrapped it, wrapped it. Then they kind of wrapped it around here, and they said, you cannot unwrap this for many weeks. And they says that sometimes hand surgery is more dangerous than eye surgery. I don't understand all of that. And they said that, so don't get it wet and don't take it down till you go to the doctor the next time. So I said, okay, I got the message, all right? The memo's there. Have you ever tried to really wash your hand with one hand? How, how do you do that, you know? And it was in the days, I know this is going to date me again, I had to wear ties. How do you tie a tie? Well, I know, get a clip on. You know how hokey those things look, all right? All right? You need both. When I want wisdom, I'm going to have to then go after the knowledge of God. If I go after the knowledge of God, then I'm going to get wisdom. So they both wash their hands together. So dads, if you want wisdom, it's going to come in your desire to really know God and that knowledge is going to come because you really fear God and how important that is. Let's go a little bit further because it just doesn't stop there on knowing God and how important it is for us to follow that wisdom. Go, if you will, to chapter 8, Proverbs chapter 8. Proverbs 8 is a chapter that when you're reading through Proverbs, it says so much in here, and you can get so lost in it that after a while you just kind of skip over because you want the real simple practical stuff. But actually, Proverbs chapter 8 is almost personifying in a personhood of what wisdom is all about. It really refers to wisdom from a, maybe looking at it as a, as a personhood. And I like to say this, you could take the word wisdom out of here and insert in the word Jesus. Does not Jesus call in verse 1? An understanding lift up her voice on top of the heights beside the way where the paths meet. Jesus takes his stand beside the gates. So when you're looking for wisdom, you're looking for Jesus. But the verse I wanted us to see is verse 11 so we can see the value of it. So dads, your heart is saying, I need wisdom, and I want my sons to be wise guys. Verse 11, for wisdom is better than jewels. Hard to believe, isn't it? Uh, jewels can give us a lot maybe for the temporal good, but jewels can also help us navigate around the issues of life. Then it goes on to say, and all desirable things cannot compare with her. Isn't it interesting because it moved away from jewels and it just says, and all desirable things cannot compare with her, with wisdom. So I want you to think of the things that you would like for Father's Day. What did you want? Your quest ought to have been, if I could have one thing, it would be wisdom. Christmas time comes. What do you want? A new lawnmower, a new pickup truck? You want to have new technology? What would you like? All those are good, but when you have wisdom, you will then know how to use what you have for his glory. You will know which ones to get, when you should get it, or if you should get it all for his glory because you are hungering and thirsting after wisdom. So dads, if I could give you, um, if I could say this properly, a hobby. Some of you are looking for something else you might like to do that's different than the old mundane day-to-day -day thing. Then let me encourage you to say, if I could do one thing, I want to pursue wisdom. I want to be a man of the book. I want to be a wise guy for God. And then secondly, when you look at your son, 
And perhaps your daughter, as a spinoff on that, you say, I want, if I could have one thing for my son, I want him to desire wisdom more than he would desire position, popularity, possessions. I want him to desire wisdom and the wisdom that would come from God's word. Now, if we do that, then God has an answer for us. He says, with that kind of wisdom, I will give that wisdom to you, and I will give it to you freely. Now, some of you know a little bit about wisdom in James chapter 1. James chapter 1 says that if you go to the Lord and you ask him for wisdom, he will give you wisdom unbraided, just freely give you that wisdom if you go to him without doubting. He can only give to you that which you already have here. So the wisdom you're going to get from God is you're going to say, you want wisdom? I'm going to give it to you. It's right here in the word. Now, you have to choose to take the word and to know this book here. Now, some of us, because we're perfectionists, we say, well, I, if I can't know it all, then I might as well not start at all. I would rather encourage you to take five minutes a day, men, and begin to really plummet its depths, one scoop of dirt at a time as you're going into the ground to pick those treasures of God's truth and call them, here it is, wisdom searches. And by you doing this, it'll give you the platform upon which you then can now teach these lessons to your son. Well, dear ones, we are out of time for today for me even to get into number one. So I would encourage you to be back with us next week, although next week I have a special 4th of July message. I'll tell you about that. And a week after that, I'm going to start right off into lesson number one. Dads, you need to be here for lesson number one because if you could only get ten lessons and only one of those the number one lesson you want to be here for that. Don't back up just yet. Next week, I want to share with you what I am going to do. Because it's the 4th of July weekend, and it's a very special weekend, I wanted you to know that, um, that I think it's important for us to know a little bit more about what is called the Judeo-Christian ethic. Most of you have heard that term bantered about. Some of you, you've never said it yourself, Judeo-Christian ethic. Others of you, it rolls off your tongue. I want to explain what that is in light of the history of our, church, of our uh, country. And then within the Judeo-Christian ethic, I want to pick out seven ethics from the Judeo-Christian ethic, seven of those upon which our country was founded upon that made us strong at the very beginning. And perhaps we need to change our mind and as Christians repent and re-own those seven again. And I won't have time to unpack all of those, but I will give you those seven next week. And I'm calling that the foundations of our country from the Judeo-Christian ethic. And I encourage you to come because for all of us, it might be these are some real hallmark truths that I too need to teach my son, although they won't be coming purely from Proverbs. Let's pray, shall we? With every head bowed and every eye closed. We've had quite an interesting day today. We began by talking about people that are in China that will be heading back after they engaged an entire community that only had three believers in Christ. You've heard about a young man who is going to take his new wife and embed himself again into a culture that is truly anti-God for the most part and try to help them to understand that Jesus Christ is the only God and faith alone in him is the only way to have eternal life. You heard that for the first time. You heard about a great, wonderful transition that's happening here amongst us and we're going to have to be children of faith to lean on the Lord as he brings us through all of this. Then you heard a little bit about dads and how a wise dad would seek the Lord for wisdom and then to own his responsibility to teach lessons to his son about God. And then we're going to begin what those lessons are. But I don't want to leave any of you today to go home without knowing that the way to have eternal life is so easy to understand and very simple to do. The understanding part of it is, is simply to understand that we've all missed the mark of God's perfection. You and I have. We can understand that God says that because of that we were born separated from Him and we will spend eternity separated from Him. We can understand that to go to heaven we'd have to be perfect but that nobody is. We can understand that good works won't get us to heaven and that takes a little bit of a stretch because we've been hearing false teaching for so long that good works get us to heaven but we have to understand that it's not by works of righteousness but it's His mercy, grace that saves us. We can understand that Jesus Christ is God and that Jesus died and He rose again on the cross and all of that that He did for us, whether we understand all of what and why, the truth still remains the same. 
He paid the sacrifice for our sins and it satisfied God the Father. And now he offers to you and me the free gift of eternal life by believing that Jesus is the Lord who died and rose again. Now today may be the very day that the light bulb comes on inside of you. And I pray that today you'd call upon the Lord to be your Savior by faith. One thing we've learned this past week with people dying, whether they fell 200 feet in a hike off one of our mountains, ridges, or whether in a car accident or drowned, we never know when we're going to die. So my friend, I pray that right now you will accept the payment Christ made for you on the cross. He did all the work because the work is involved. He did it though. Whether you understand all about it, he did it. It's done. It's a done deal. Now he's offering to you the free ticket. Free to us, expensive to him. So what do you do? Simply say, Lord, I know that I do not deserve to go to heaven. There's nothing I can do, but I receive from you your full forgiveness, your grace, and your mercy. And I'm now fully trusting in you because you said, he that believes on you has everlasting life. And I don't believe that you're just a historical figure of some religious leader that they write about called the Bible. But I believe that you are God. And I want an eternal relationship with you now and forever in heaven. And you would give that to me if I would trust you. Now, my friend, it's not so much a prayer as much as it is a true transaction of your faith from being yourself or good works or some other religious system. And now you're taking that childlike faith and you're placing it in Christ. You can't make a mistake. God knows your faith. He knows if you're trusting the right object, which would be him and him alone. So on the authority of his word that is truth, you can have eternal life. Now, I'd like to pray for you, but I'm not going to have you come forward. I'm not going to make you do anything that would outwardly embarrass you. Uh, Christianity really begins as an inside job. The outside stuff comes on later on, not to be saved, but as an outward display. But if you're trusting Christ as your Savior, I'm going to ask you to slip up your hand. And, and that's just a man's invitation, not God's. And the reason I ask you to raise your hand is so I can pray for you. Now, me praying for you doesn't pray you into heaven. It just is because I care for you. I care for the Lord, I care for his word, and I care for what happens when people trust in Christ. And, and it gives me an opportunity to rejoice with you in a prayer. So I want to know if I can talk to the Lord about you and welcome you into God's family. Not joining the church here, just God's family. So is there anyone here today that finally said, you know, I, I do want to go to heaven. Jesus is the only way. I'm trusting him. My good works will never get me there. If today's the day, would you slip up your hand? Because I'd, I'd like to know if today you're trusting Christ. Never done it before, today's the day. Would you do it? Thank you, my friend. Our gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. And that we dads just scratched the surface. And maybe that's good. Maybe all we talked about today, Father, was the importance that we dads have that was a mandate given to us millenniums ago. And that through this, Christianity is still surviving today. But maybe it needs to thrive more because we need to man up, dad up. Father, I thank you for the model that Solomon had from his own father, David, and that he was inspired by you to write these proverbs and many of them dealing with what a son needs to know about you and about life and that they're recorded so we have this truth in front of us that we can look at every day. And so, Lord, we know that the greatest thing we can teach is this message of wisdom and that wisdom is found in the fear of the Lord. And then, Father, in the knowledge of God. And so, Lord, we thank you that you are inside of us now as a believer, as your child, helping us to understand these deep truths as well as to empower us to live them out. And so, Father, we thank you that whether we're a dad, a single mom, a son, young or old, or a daughter, that, Father, you've left us your word, your spirit, and the principle to teach it and to learn it. Now, Father, we pray this in Jesus' name.